Good morning. Today we're going to be looking at packaging. Now, the reason we're looking at packaging at this point is that we would look at boxes that Escher has produced using his tessellations. And as you can see from this slide, there are a couple of examples there of how he created 3D shapes with his tessellations. And of course, to do this, he probably would have used some form of cardboard. We're going to look at different materials that are used for packaging and why it's used. If we think about very early packaging, mankind has probably always had some form of material to transpose his ingredients around. So, for example, a Stone Age man went out to kill an animal on the prairies. He would have needed something to wrap that material in to bring it back, to stop the flies getting at it, to keep it clean, to preserve it. He probably would have used some animal skin to do that. Or if he was out collecting leaves or berries, he'd also need some sort of sack to put that material in to bring it back. So it kept it clean and it kept it in one place. So packaging has been with us since the dawn of mankind in one form or another. A little bit of packaging history. Man in 15,000 BC in Egyptians developed glass blowing technology. And we know this because we found examples of very small glass bottles that were buried with Egyptian pharaohs. So we know that they developed this technology a long time ago. In 1795, uh, the French leader Napoleon offered a prize for somebody to come up by a way and means of preserving food. Now, he wanted this because he wanted to be, you give it to his armies so that they could go off um, into battle and preserve food, make it last longer. One of the chefs at that time developed a technology by heating food, putting it into glass bottles and using corks. What happens is as the food cools down, the cork is pulled tighter and tighter into the bottle and it causes a seal, which means that the food lasts a long, long time. And of course, we use this technology today in jam jars. The same principle, you heat the food, put a lid on, screw it tight, and that food preserves for a long period. In 1854, tins were arrived for the first time and these were produced for a Crimean War. The same idea of putting food into a container, sealing it in there while it's hot and sealing it to keep the air off means that that food preserves for a long period of time. And in the 1930s, food in tin cans appeared for the very first time on shelves in shops. Bit of interesting facts. All of 60% of all packaging that's ever produced is made for food. So Packaging is around us and is used by us in lots of different ways. But have you thought about this? How far has that packaging traveled? So pizzas that we normally think is an Italian food and we buy them in Britain and we take them home to eat. Most of them, like this ristorante version, is made by a German company. So it's produced in Germany, packaged in Germany, taken to Britain and sold as an Italian product. So how far does your food travel in your packaging? So what I want to do today is look at just six types of packaging functions, what it does. Protect, inform, contains, transports, preserves and display. Let's look at those in a bit more detail. Protect. We talked about cavemen going out, hunting down the meat and bringing it back. So packaging has always been there to protect things. Packaging very often is, has a very thick outer and something like corrugated card, which is used on bigger boxes and on egg boxes, insulates the product by protecting it from knocks. Sometimes packaging has a secondary layer. So, for example, on the chocolate box, not only has it got an outside cardboard container, it's also got an inside cardboard layer. And this secondary packaging is dividing the product up and separating it to protect it. And the same thing is happening with the eggs. By separating them, it's enabling them to be protected. Inform. Packaging does have to inform us, whether it's just to tell us what the food is that's inside the box, so we get the brand name. But we also need far more material than that. We need to know far more information about our food that we eat. 
And on the bottom left-hand corner, there's a list of things that by law, each company needs to tell us. Not only does it need to tell us what it's called, it should also give us a contact address. So if there's any product that has a problem, we can contact that company. We also need to know a list of every single ingredient. So for example, on the Doritos, underneath is a list of all the ingredients that's inside of Doritos, right down to the tiny, tiny chemicals that are in that product. And of course, we need to know that because some people have allergies. We need to know, for example, that this contains milk ingredients for somebody who's lactose intolerant. We need to know the sell by date. So when is this product going to go off? We need to know how to store it. Should it be kept in a fridge or should it be kept frozen? We need to know the nutritional information. So, for example, on the right hand side, we have here a whole load of information about the amount of fats, sugars and salts that's in this particular product. And this is very, very important these days with people looking after their weight. We need to know, for example, how much salt are we eating on a daily basis because it's not good for our health. We also need to know the weight of the product. And this is important because if we're being sold a bag of 30 gram crisps, we need to make sure that it has actually got 30 grams of food inside that product. Contain packaging obviously just holds everything in one place. And it does that in a variety of ways, whether it's a piece of cardboard or a piece of plastic, or in the case with the tangerine, a bag of net, a net that's holding things in one place. So the primary resource of packaging is to contain, to hold it. Transportation, our packaging, as we've seen, can be transported all around the world. So it's important that we understand that packaging not only contains things, it needs to be able to be shipped very, very carefully. So, for example, the tins on the top right are able to be stacked on a pallet and transported on ships around the world. If products come in an unusual shape, so for example with a milk bottle, it's sometimes put on a pallet and then is wrapped again with further packaging around the outside to make sure it's stable while being transported. And again, this is secondary packaging that's the sort that we don't get to see in the shop, but it's packaging that is used to enable one set of packaging to be transported from one place to another. We talked about this a little bit, about the history of pres preservation in food in packaging. Glass is used and has been used right back since the Egyptians to contain products and enable them to last longer. So, for example, the jam is put in a jam jar and is sealed. Remember, the way this is done is hot food is put into the glass jar and then is sealed while it's still hot. And This causes a vacuum on the top of the food that stops the air getting in. Tins is used in the same way. Tins are sealed while the food is still warm, and that enables a vacuum to be caused inside the packaging that keeps the food and stops it going off. Display, something that's become more and more important in the last 50 years. Because there's so much competition on the market, it's important that the product advertises itself. So it doesn't just tell us what's inside, it promotes it. So the box itself has to look attractive interesting, eye-catching. The top ones do that by having a hole in the box so we can see the fantastic product inside, the beautiful chocolate that's inside those boxes, sells it for us. Sometimes if the product is not very exciting, so for example with cereal, if there was a window on the cereal itself, it wouldn't look very exciting. We have a mock-up of something on the front instead. So, Packaging companies use photographs and graphics to advertise and to sell that product to us, to make it look exciting and interesting. And they do this by using colour and fantastic, fun, interesting shapes and cartoon characters. Packaging, basically, once it's opened up, is what we call a net, a packaging net. And nets come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, depending on the box that they're trying to produce. So a net is basically a flat shape, which then makes up into 3D form. Key thing about a net is that it has gluing tabs. So very often, once you open it up and lay it flat, you would see there's extra packaging that's there to enable the whole thing to be glued together. Sometimes it has something called a locking tab, 
which is how the box is secured and locked together. Sometimes packaging is displayed so that the information is upside down on the net because it needs to be like that to be able to be formed in a particular way. Once the net has been cut out, it's then assembled. In industry, of course, they wouldn't use scissors and glue. They use a manufacturing process called die cutting. And there's an example of a die cutter on the bottom right hand of this slide. It's where a series of knives are pressed into a former and these are punched through the card to make sure that it can punch the shape out very clearly. And because there's very sharp knives and because the former is very secure, it can do this again, again and again and mass produce the cardboard shape. Sometimes the former has sharp edges which cuts through the cards and sometimes the former has rounded edges. And the reason for that is that it folds the card. It impresses and indents the card so that it can be folded at a later date. 